Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Digital Pan Australian FPNA Board. Today we'll discuss the art and science of XPNA business partnering. My name is Hans Gobin. I'm the International FPNA Board and FPNA Trends Ambassador, and today uh, I'll be your facilitator. Uh, joining us today, we have nearly 400 people. Uh, of which 77% is joining us from Australia and the remainder from 20, sorry, 33 other countries. So we have great presentation for you in store. Uh, these are the previous meetings we've had in the territory. So um, please have a look at it. It's a good time for me to just take you through what we're planning to talk about today. So today we'll talk about what is XPNA business partnering, uh, the business partnering model, a case study in Microsoft, enabling FPNA skill set for XPNA business partnering. How can modern technology enhance and transform business partnering models? Integrative intelligence in XPNA, conclusion and recommendation, and then the QA session. It is now a good time for me to introduce to you the members of the panel we have. So members of the panel, if you can switch on your webcam um, and join me. So first I have uh, Christina Oce. Christina is our first speaker today. She's Director of Finance at Cummings South Pacific, a global power leader, directing teams in all area of finance function. With over 20 years of experience in all aspects of finance, she has held senior finance role in various large multinationals and managed and worked with team across growth. Uh, Christina is a Melbourne FPNA board member where she is joining us from today. And she will talk to us about XPNA means to her in her organization. Christina, great to have you with us today. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Love to, lovely to be here. Thank you very much, Christina. Our second panelist is Takeshi Murakami, who is Group Finance Manager and Controller at Microsoft, Microsoft in Tokyo, Japan, where she joins us from. Takeshi has experience in various global companies and is skilled in business planning, cross-functional leadership, and management analytical skills. He's also a Tokyo FPNA board member, and today will take us through the case study in Microsoft. Takeshi, great to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Connor Hopkins will be our third speaker. She's Head of Finance, Business Planning and Reporting at Western Power Australia, has over 20 years of experience as finance professional in the UK and Australia, working within various sectors leading teams through organizational change and improving financial partnering, increasing commercial acumen and awareness within organization is her passion. She's also a co-chair with Western Australian Committee for Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, SEMA. Uh, Connor is a Perth FPNA board member where she joins us from today and she will speak to us about skill sets required for XBNA business partnering. Connor, great to have you with us. Thank you, Hans. Great to be here. Uh, Raul is our fourth member today. He's an experienced enterprise management consultant at Jedox with 13 years of experience in areas of pre sales, solution architecture, project management, and implementation. And he has collaborated with companies and industries such as hospitality, telecom manufacturing, retail, oil and gas, and FMCG. Rahul joins us from Singapore and will be sharing insights on how technology can help us to be better business partnering. Rahul, great to have you with us. Thank you, Hans. It's been a pleasure to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Finally, we've got Himashi with us, um, who is Managing Director APAC for Association of Financial Professionals. She leads the A. AFP's Asia Division Building Customer Relationship and Developing Partnership within Asia Pacific Region. Uh, she is an integral part of helping Treasury and finance pra practitioners achieve their goal through training for Certified Treasury as well as Certified FPME. 
she joins us from Singapore and will today share with us her experience on integrative um, intelligence. Imashi, great to have you with us today. Thank you, Hans. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got um, a great panel and great insight and presentation to share with you today. So looking forward to that. Members of the panel, if you can switch off your webcam, I've got a few more slides to go through and then we will start uh, properly. So thank you very much. Um, moving on. So today we're bringing together Perth, Melbourne, Sydney, San Francisco, uh, sorry, not San Francisco, Sydney and Brisbane chapter together out of our 27 um, chapters in 16 countries and four continents. Um, just also to highlight that we're also doing best practice workshop and FPNA consultancy um, at the request of our members. Takeshi, your camera is on, by the way. Um, ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you that uh, the format today, it's a 90 minutes webinar. Um, your participation is via four polling questions, so please uh, give us your insight. We've got interactive Q&A session via the chat box, so please ask questions. You can ask as from now or ask after each presentation directed to the member of the panel. And keep asking, we will answer a few today. The ones we can't answer, we will answer um, via email. The presentation is available in handouts, please download them. You will receive the recording and a copy of the presentation within two days after the meeting. Um, so please uh, do that. And finally, at the end of the session, there's a brief survey. Please give us your feedback. Um, it is a good time to thank our technology sponsor, which is Jedox. As we all know, Jedox is uh, modern corporate performance management, one of the smartest platform for planning, reporting and analytics. Thank you, Jedox. Um, our recruitment partner, Michael Page, which is one of the leading professional recruitment consultancies. Thank you very much, Michael Page. And finally, AFP, as we heard um, uh, about Himashi, uh, the Professional Society for Finance and Treasury Professional, as well as Standard Excellence in Global Finance, so um, FPNA certification. I've got a couple of quick slides to take you through. So just what is XPNA business partnering? It's no longer the, the typical um, finance business partnering we know. The partner attributes shown here to yourself are more around collaboration, motivating education, analytical, challenging. Uh, Keely, uh, it's about integration and the strategic and business operational plan, leveraging technology. The FPNA business partnering maturity model. Uh, you guys would have seen that we've got three different states that we we'll talk about here: the basic state, the developing state, and the leading state, which is the key one. So, in the leading stage, what we have, we've got collaborative approach. We've got, in terms of business law knowledge, a really strong business knowledge, big degree of influence. In terms of soft skills, you're looking at challenging. Uh, ability to persuade, effective communicator, storyteller. Analytics is key, so driver-based modeling, real-time uh, scenario planning, and finally, uh, integrated uh, technological platform with the use of AI and prescriptive and AI capabilities. So uh, please bear that in mind. Let us now move on to our first presentation, which is by Christina Oce and uh, she's Director of Finance at Cummings, and she will talk to us about what is XPNA business partnering to her. Christina, over to you. Thank you much. Um, so much hands. Yeah, my name is Christina. I'm currently Director of Finance at Cummings. Cummings is a, a quickly a global power leader in a, um, and has complementary business units in, in designing, manufacturing, servicing, and distributing um, power solutions um, around the globe. And um, we want to start off with a quote in my next slide and, and then really evaluate why we're actually um, looking at this topic. And um, this, this quote from Jessica Jekyll is the reason she's not that well known, but it really resonates with me. She's the founder of a microfund um, crowdfunding organization 
and it is really all about creating um, value in the future in these uncertain times I think especially in this environment we've seen that we um, creating value is one of the key key items we're looking for and and what she does here she she talks about um, empowering each other with tools and really unlocking more possibilities as um, as a reality and I think this is what business partnering in essence is all about that's why that resonated with me and when I think about it on in, in my next slide, I will really start looking with um, with the end game in mind. What what is actually what are we here are setting out to do? And um, I was looking at at these items. How can we actually define value creation? What are we actually trying to achieve as business partners to add value to the business? So business performance measurement will always be part of the finance function or the business partnering function. But it might actually go um, beyond just measuring what we used to measure, but really creating appropriate KPIs that really measure what matters and, and make a difference to the business and help meeting and exceeding the targets. Decision support, um, there's hundreds of decisions to be done in a business on a daily basis. And it could be ranging from pricing and discounting decisions to just um, inventory decisions, how to optimize business performance. So there's a, a great area of value we can add. Investment evaluation, this is for me always critical and it goes way beyond um, just capital investment, really helping um, the business units we're dealing with understanding where to um, spend resources, like maybe um, a marketing campaign and really measuring what value that added and learning and, and making the right decisions going forward. Very important for me is this competitive intelligence. If you really want to be able to help the business, you need to understand the landscape of um, competition, understanding the capabilities, the pricing structures, and really understanding where, where the strengths and weaknesses are in, in the competitive environment. The change predictor, this is um, probably something we all would want to know. There is a lot of discussion around disruptors out there and, and someone who's watching out to what market trends or what um, technology trends are developed is, is very helpful for a business to understand where to be or maybe even put, um, put themselves in the position of being the disruptor rather than being disrupted. Short-term and long-term planning. Um, this is the very, very close to my heart because very often we make the mistake that um, short-term gains are traded against long-term planning and long-term goals. So finding the, the balance between the two is incredibly important and, and helping to find that sweet spot to ensure a long, um, long-lasting um, strategic outlook. The ultimate game, obviously, for business um, partners would be to sit on the table to formulate strategy and, and help execute it. It's obviously um, one of the, the aims we should be really, and in, in, if we have these understandings and the other areas, we're probably in the best position to do so and, and really be um, a business partner and help creating um, value. So for many organizations, we find this value creation is a continuum and um, everyone is on a different journey and a different part of the journey, but better insights and product and development, uh, product and product development, product profitability go a long way to help um, adding value. So the key message really is uncertain times require significant more insights on uh, refocusing on goals to create these values. And like in the next slide, I'd like to explore a little bit a model um, and, and opportunities, how we can orchestrate a value creation. And when we start with the first point, creating opportunities to open up discussion, this is really around listening and really understand, deeply understanding the business, creating these relationships and with business and key stakeholders, earning your seat on the table, as you would want to say, and support long-term and short-term priorities. priorities. And, and an example how we try to achieve that is really um, helping our business partners to move away from the stigma of governance and retrospective reviews helping them to be creative, um, collective responsibilities with shared goals, embed accounting knowledge in the business um, at the front end and, and really understand each other's context. Um, race, price, media, different viewpoints. Um, this is really helping 
and, and uh, facilitating the discussion from various areas of the organization, cross-functional, um, removing barriers and, and really challenging long-hold views. Um, flexibility to embrace change, really, really looking and, and thinking outside the box. There is a lot of opportunities here. And for, for example, what we try to achieve here is evaluating investment decisions, um, create sound validation processes and, and challenge assumptions so that we can learn and have a continuous improvement in decision making. Facilitate understanding by use of visuals. That's obviously something not everyone is a numbered person and, and having um, concepts illustrated in easy to catch um, visuals that is helping the business to understand the point is very important. We can, um, we can move away from just um, finance data. This can be a lot more broader in market data understanding. So really demystifying finance data and illustrate that. We've done that um, a couple of times with our leaders to, to basically have like product or market opportunities illustrated by bubbles on a scale. And the size of the bubble helps people to understand the market opportunity and the investment um, uh, associated. So that really helps and gels knowledge very quickly. And obviously simplify systems, construct knowledge. Obviously, integrated business systems will ease the burden of remote reporting and harmonize information across the whole organization, broaden the knowledge and identify um, possibilities. And simplicity is here the key uh, to drive value and generate knowledge across the business and recognize different viewpoints. We're working on the journey to bring all these various um, data source information together. Um, currently with Power BI, really illustrating how things are interrelated and, and how the, the data pool flows together to, to, to show how the, the various data points are interrelated and connected. So we really, the, the whole framework is to articulate the components to enhance finance business partnering, blending control and business performance, and really all about unlocking possibilities and embracing uncertainty and listening and, and learning. And reflecting on these concepts, we, we have, um, like, like every organization is on a different path on this journey. But what we all have in common is um, that we have challenges to achieve it and to get there. And I want to raise a few challenges on my next slide, um, just very briefly showing that I identified three different elements um, where I think we need to focus on. Um, on my next slide, I will show that. Yes, yeah, here we go. It changed. So um, there's always a little bit delay. So really skills and competencies are a challenging area. So we need to um, help our, our, um, our business partners to be relationship builders, um, having a strategic mindset, challenge the status quo and, and be analytically minded, but still commercially focused, very important. Um, on the right hand side, we, we talked about systems and tools and how challenging that is and we hear a bit more later. For me, the business acceptance in the middle is really important. Um, we, we see headwinds when, when businesses um, need to learn that finance is actually there to add value and quick wins and, and early value events that, that we can demonstrate credibility will help if we help our our, our our teams to to really identify opportunities where they can add value that will embed them in the slowly in the business units and they can create this value we just talked about and that's for me i'll leave it there thank you christina thank you very much for a great presentation and sharing with us you know the value creation element of um xpna business partnering just as a reminder to um our attendees uh, XPNA organization. XPNA means extended planning and analysis. This is where you know FPNA is going beyond just the finance to all the different business units within the organization. So your sales and, and operation planning, supply chain, HR, um, etc. And and this is where we look forward to integration of our business plan with the operational plan and the strategic plan. So just thought I'd add that. Um, can I ask my fellow member of the panel, Takeshi and Connor, to come and join us and give us some comments on 
um, uh, Christina's presentation, please. So Takeshi, if I may start with yourself, your quick comment, please. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Christina, uh, for the great presentation. I thought uh, it was great that you mentioned the use of the visuals in the value creation section. So I just got reminded that the finance typically present with all the numbers with the details, right? Tons of details. So, and we're not able to uh, convey what we, the message that we want to land. So what we need to do is that we need to distill all that complex information, you know, and then take out the essence, simplify it and crystallize the visuals uh, with, a, with, with a visual. So uh, in the top, you know, you will need to build and brush up all the storytelling skills using those visuals. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and that's uh, coming from my side. Back to you, Hans. Thank you, Takeshi. Connor, can I come to you, please? Yeah, certainly. I think for me, I agreed with the, the quote about empowering each other. Um, and I think something that's really important for us and for the extended partnering is getting the seat at the table. Because I think that's when we really do make that difference of helping each other out um, and ultimately adding that value to the business and what we can bring to the table. So. Thank you, Christina. It was definitely empowering each other and breaking down the silos. Thank you, members of the panel. Thank you, Christina, for uh, your presentation. Let us now hear from our um, uh, attendees on what they think about XPNA in their organization. I'm just going to quickly launch a, a poll. If you can vote, please. So, where would you say your organization is on the XPNA business partnering journey? Uh, no plans for an integrated FPNA business partnering model. So across business, across um, company wide, uh, we do plan to implement such a structure in the near future. Um, we run already an integrated FPNA business partnering model. So if you can vote, please, that will be great. Um, so first option, no plans at all. Second option, we have some plans we will implement shortly. And the third option is we run an integrated FPNA business partnering model already. Um, I am now going to close the poll and I will share the results with the panelists and yourselves. So 22% say there's no plans at all, 42% say there is plan to implement shortly, and 36% very um, interestingly uh, are already running an XPNA business partnering model. Fantastic results. Can I ask Christina and Takeshi to give us some comment? Christina, starting by yourself. Yeah, that's actually an interesting results. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that 36% is already um, way on the journey to do that. Um, it's it's good news. I'm, I'm surprised that this number is so high, but not surprised that many uh, following suit quickly behind because it's such an important um, development for us in finance. Thank you very much. Um, and Takeshi, your quick comment, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm also surprised to see this result. We do plan to implement such a structure in the new future. So, um, uh, so, so, so it's, it's, for me, it's a great learning. Just, uh, just a quick comment. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. So let me just hide this and we'll move on with our presentation. Um, and um, our next presentation is on XPNA business partnering, the model from uh, Microsoft. And to deliver that, we've got Takeshi, who is Group Finance Manager and Controller at Microsoft. Uh, Takeshi, over to you. Yep, thank you, Hans. So uh, thank you, my name is Takeshi Murakami. I'm Group Controller at Microsoft, uh, based in Tokyo, Japan. Today, the agenda is about the, how the modern technology can enhance and a transform business partnering models and the transformation journey that and the uh, skill set required for XPNA uh, business partnering. So hence, um, I would like to share the challenges that we face today and then our journey on how we leverage digital technology to overcome these challenges. And finally, how uh, it's challenge uh, changing the way uh, we engage with our business partners. So flash out the next page, please. I oh, already did. Okay. So to start with, um, I would like to mention that our business environment is dramatically changing. Uh, as you can see here, uh, smart devices, smart office, autonomous, autonomous vehicle, and you can easily imagine that this new environment uh, boosting and creating a balance of the data every day. 
So, and uh, increasing this data will also create difficulties and can be a huge blocker when uh, we operate in a business. Uh, in the next slide, I would like to share some of the challenges that we face. So, next please. Uh, and of course, the data, the big data will benefit the business. Uh, it enables us to uh, uh, provide a greater insights uh, and it, it also opens up for the new opportunities, right? Uh, but only if you're able to manage it well. Uh, if you're not capable of handling it, uh, then you'll be overwhelmed, uh, spending a lot of time on collecting the data and forcing, uh, you're forced to spend a lot of time uh, on the non-value added manual work and which will eventually lead to error prone processes and uh, actually uh, generate the bigger problems like uh, government risk and other threats. In the next slide, to overcome these difficulties, I would like to quickly share uh, some of the digital technologies that we leverage at Microsoft. And this also improved our partnership and delivered a greater impact to the business. So these are the examples uh, of Microsoft digital transmission arenas. Uh, we split into four categories. Uh, just to pick some examples uh, from the very left hand side in the financial analysis and reporting section, uh, this is basically how we use the BI, uh, so called the business intelligence tool to automate the reporting to be more agile and the business decision making process. Uh, and moving away from the Excel to automate. So we, we, so we even we, we sell Excel, but we encourage to move out from the Excel to move to, move to the BI. And secondly, in the orange section, the strategy and the forecasting section, uh, these are the primarily about the AI and the machine learning. Uh, we, uh, where we leverage it for um, forecasting, prediction, and capacity planning and whatnot. Uh, and in the business process uh, automation arena, uh, some examples are to leverage the chatbots for basic Q and A's uh, to improve the agility and efficiency. Uh, and in the uh, risk management section, taking a compliance predictive analysis as an example, uh, this is where we capture the unusual transaction uh, automatically by AI and flag it and inform finance controllers what, uh, what they need to do uh, to follow up. So now the machine will provide recommendation and tell you actually what to do. So these are the examples. And I would like to mention, of course, these did not happen in just a day, or day uh, at Microsoft. Um, today, uh, you know, today we cannot cover all the details on the AI and the BI due to the time limitation. But what I would like to quickly share today is the journey on the data cleansing, uh, because when I talk about uh, this uh, with the customer or any other financial professionals, data cleansing is the biggest blocker uh, and it's the biggest pain where we move on to the BI and AI. So in the next slides, I would like to share a journey. Uh, we, stand, we spend a lot of time, uh, uh, especially on the data, uh, cleaning up the data. Uh, in this slide, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, whether we use the BI or leverage the uh, machine learning or other digital technologies, the quality of the data is the core and the key. And if the data is not clean, then we cannot put the data and run it in the AI model or the machine learning model. So since the uh, early 2000s, as part of the BPI or BPO, uh, we call one finance or the core finance. Uh, we worked on centralized all the reports and operating you know, operations into the one location in three regions, uh, Asia, Europe, uh, and the US slash Americas. Uh, for Asia, it will be uh, mainly on the India. So we leveraged the external consulting firm um, and consolidated centralized all the existing reports to Asia to them and then eliminated the duplicated reports in Asia, focusing on the centralization and standardization of the data and the reports. During that process, the definition and the taxonomies uh, of the data got cleaner, cleaner, and the worldwide level. Also, we discouraged each country to create their own reports, uh, but to use the one that is centralized in the region or use the BI reports that HQ centrally created. Uh, so as, as an example, at the quality business review, the data and the metrics that in the deck uh, is basically based on the reports from the BI Corp created or the HQ created. And then uh, we are not allowed to any, add any uh, locally created reports in the deck. Uh, it was a, may, uh, it was a, it was a many uh, trial and error uh, and took time, but it enabled us to move to the next step where, where, uh, where we started around 2014 uh, to the stage uh, which we call the modern finance. 
Uh, this is where that we leverage AI, machine learning, and drought automation. So now I would like to share uh, the key message under this modern finance uh, in the next slide. So this chart is about the impact of our modern finance journey. Uh, it is about how we turn in the data into action in the quickest way possible. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side, uh, at the beginning, the data is about cleaning up the data I mentioned in the previous slides, creating a single source of truth. And, and, and when the data is ready, now we, move, uh, we can move and produce the business intelligence. And the transformation flows goes from the top to the bottom. Uh, in the beginning, we start with a static report. Uh, basically, this is the Excel. Uh, this could only tell what happened. Uh, it does not really uh, allow to drill down or quickly or didn't produce any insight from our business. Furthermore, the amount of money or process and work that we had to put together to build these reports and insights are still huge. Uh, and then BI came in place, allowing the interactive reporting, making meetings much more dynamic, helping us understand why why it happened, reducing the amount of manual processes, but still uh, we could only look at the past. Then we crossed the line and start looking at the future uh, with the advanced analytics. Uh, with the machine learning, we can now learn from the past to predict the future, uh, understand what will happen. And as you can see, the distance between data and actions is much, much shorter now. The amount of manual process and human errors are lower as well. Finally, uh, with a further process, uh, now the machine learning tells you what to do. Uh, automation, uh, automating the decision-making process and moving really fast from the data to decision and then to the action. So the key message here is that taking data and turning data into the action. And more importantly, adding the value to the business in the fastest and most relevant way. Uh, this is a long journey and we are still um, working and struggling to get this uh, improved. But with the amount of time we saved through automation, it, in, it, it uh, actually enabled us to shift our time and focus to uh, value added and higher ROI tasks. In the next final slide, I would like to share it a bit more. So here, um, I would like to share how our focus is shifting. So without all the digital technologies enabling us to save time a lot, uh, which also means that we need to shift the way we do business and how we interact with the business partners. So uh, the before section, uh, if you look at these slides, the requirement is about the operating, operational thinking, expertise in handling transaction and task management. But now with AI, the machine learning will tell you, and oh sorry, machine learning will automate that for you. In the past, oh sorry, in the, in the after section, now the skill set requires uh, and how we play the role is shifting the required capabilities and skill sets to having deep analytical and strategic thinking, uh, influence the business and be able to negotiate. So these are the skills required, uh, spending time on the higher RI tasks, having a greater impact and drive the business. And through this, uh, our learning is that technologies are the just enablers to automate things. And of course, you will also need a, a stronger leaders to drive this change and you will have to have a good process to run it. But what really important is how we transform ourselves and drive the business impact. Um, and I'm really excited about all the great changes coming in the financial professionals arena. So with that, uh, it's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening, everyone. Wow, what a presentation, um, Takeshi. And, and you've shown from the very beginning of your transformation journey where you started, where you went, and you ended up with the skill set, which is just fantastic. And these are the skill set and how they are changing under the XPNA uh, organization. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Christina and Connor to join us and give us some quick comments on uh, Takeshi's presentation, please. Um, Christina, if I may ask um, you to start first. Yeah, absolutely. Very good presentation, Takeshi. Really enjoyed this. Very clear, highlighting the challenges. Um, we're all familiar with the um, data collection challenges, but really highlighting the data cleansing and standardization is the key um, for success here. What, what I think it is really helpful to step through your process, the opportunities where you actually started uh, making these changes and what the opportunities are here. I really like that slide where you show from from uh, like from what we used to do explaining what happened in the past um, to where we can go to automation with 
on those journey being able to predict the future and i think that's that's really the, the aim and predictive analytics is is probably a field we need to spend time in and really this slide shows where where that value shift comes about i think that was really helpful for us to understand um, the journey you are thank you hey, connor your quick comments please yeah, um, thanks, Akeshi. Um, I really appreciate what you've shared with us there. Um, and there's a, a lot that grabs my attention. Um, I like Christina, it's that, that importance of the data at the end of the day and it being clean. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter how good your visualiza visualization tools are, you really, really need that data set up for success. Um, so I guess for some of us, and I know I've experienced it too, with Excel still going to be our friend for a while. Uh, we do want to keep moving away from Excel and focusing on those BI tools, but until we get that data schmick, I, I can't quite see how we're going to free ourselves from our friend um, Excel. Um, and I, I noticed too, I think you, you're using machine learning for your forecasting and headcount forecasting in that one. I know I've got some finance partners who would absolutely love it if we could have uh, machine learning do all of our headcount forecasting. So that one really rang a bell with me as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comment, um, members of the panel. And Takeshi, great presentation again. Thank you very much. Let us now okay. hear from our um, uh, attendees today, our FPNA board members, on uh, question and polling number two, which I'm just going to launch right now. So if you can vote, please. So where do you believe your organization is on the XPNA business partnering maturity model? So the three state that I quickly took you through. Is it still at the basic state? Is it at the developing state? Or do you believe it is at a leading state? If you can vote, please, that would be great. Are you first at the basic state, secondly, at the developing state, and thirdly, at the leading stage? Um, also a reminder that you guys can please um, send via chat box your question and direct them now to the correct uh, panelists as well. So I am now going to um, close the vote and I will now um, share it. And I would like to ask Takeshi to join us and give us some comments on what we're seeing here. Takeshi, over to you. So 35% have said the basic state, 60% developing state, and 5% are at that leading stage. What are your thoughts, Takeshi? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, based on my conversation with the customers, many of the Japanese customers are now in a basic store development state. So uh, I think there's no surprise to this. But, you know, under this COVID-19 situation, I think the digital transformation or the old transformation is happening really, really fast. It's just accelerating. So, you know, next one year, one or two years, three years, I'm hoping that we will see more of the leading state. And I know I will, uh, we will, and, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. Fantastic, thank you. And, and, uh, and of course, very encouragingly, we see 60% in the developing states. So people are moving. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you very much, Takeshi. And let me just hide this now and we'll move on to our next session, which is on skill set. And to deliver that, we've got Connor, a head of planning and reporting at Western Power. Connor, over to you. Ready when you are. Okay, thanks, Hans. Yep. I'm Connor Hopkins, Head of Business Planning and Reporting at Western Power. And for a bit of context, Western Power owns and operates the Transmission and Distribution Electricity Network, or GRID, here in the southwest of Western Australia. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about today is that transformation journey, or the finance transformation, and how do you enable the skill set for the XPNA business partnering or that extended business partnering in your business? Um, so I chose a quote today that I think speaks to something that's really important for any transformation or any deployment of new technology in a business, because it really the successful implementation, I feel, really depends on not the technology itself, but the people and the mindsets that you have in the business that are going to be using that technology. And a key characteristic for me, um, for any successful partnering with that, is curiosity and the confidence to ask questions. Uh, and that's why I chose this quote by Albert Einstein. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. So how do we help nurture and enable that, that 
curiosity or, or ability to question in our people to help them along to become successful ex p a business partners. Um, so what I wanted to focus on is the type of investment that you might want to put into helping your people with that. Um, and on the next slide, I'll talk to the, the balance of the investment that you'd probably want to consider. And it's, it's definitely will help manage the change. So for any transformation, there is a big mix of investment between time, effort, resources, and your dollars. Uh, and from my experience, you really want to be weighting that, as you can see from the graphic here, towards your people. Whether that's the time or when you actually start investing in your people, you really need to be focusing on that. And it's not to say that the technology is not a, uh, an important part of that. Um, it's As you can see from the prior slides, embracing the technology to change and free up our people from the shackles of spreadsheets at month end is really, really important. Um, we need to remove that mundane task of repetitive and manual report writing at month end because it isn't value add and it's not really where we want our people to be. We want them to be out of the business and partnering with them. But new technology is not going to be the key to, to any success in a transformation. And it's usually because your workforce and their mindset is not moving at the same pace as you may be changing with your technology. So we know changing position descriptions and titles doesn't change the person. I think we've probably all been there. Where one day we were an analyst and the next day we're finance partners. But do we really, really understand what it is to be a finance partner and what we need to do to go out to the business and be successful as it? And most of the time we don't. Um, and if we're leading through a transformation, we need to know how to help our people along with that. And in fact, if you can get your people to be part of the transformation and on the journey of implementing that, the new processes and technology, you'll actually build a lot more buy-in and increase trust as well. So what sort of approach can you take to helping people along with that and with the training? So on the next slide, I'll just uh, talk to you briefly about some of the things you might want to think about when you're looking at that investment and where to focus your training. So again, remember, it's, it's systems don't change the people, it's people who change the systems. So if you think about it, if you throw a lot of new technology at people and new processes at them and you don't support them, it's kind of like giving them the keys to the car, but they don't know how to drive. You could be setting them up for a crash and they will lose a lot of confidence. So you will be pushing people out of their comfort zone when you're um, setting them out on a, on a journey of learning and transformation and, and uh, training. Um, and you need to be appreciative that you're asking them to change what they've always known or what they've always done. Um, and they might not be comfortable with that at all. In fact, so to some of them, it's, it often means that they won't embrace the change and they'll be resistant to it. And that will also hamper your transformation. So there's a few things that I thought would be good to focus on. Um, and I've, I've put them here. I won't have time to go through all of them. But one of the things that you can think about and start thinking about changing straight away and using straight away are knowledge sharing sessions, because they don't really cost much either to invest in it. And this is where you can um, get your teams to actually share knowledge with each other. It's where they present back to each other about something that they do in their day-to-day -day jobs. It could be where they've improved a process and they play it back to, as to how they did it. And the double win about this is that people practice their presentation skills. They learn from each other um, and they learn how to give constructive and supportive feedback to each other. And what that leads to is greater confidence um, credibility, um, and particularly, like I said, confidence when they go out to the business that what they're presenting has been peer tested and they can be confident that they're actually going out with the right information. And it makes a huge difference to them. So that's one element you can think of. It's also something that's really useful when you're starting with a new visualization tool as well, when you can uh, practice with each other and test, test your ideas out on each other. Oh. One thing to think about too is when you're looking at where to focus your training, 
is understand where those gaps might be with your people. It could be in soft skills, could be in the technical skills, or it could just be playing in the business knowledge, it's uh, a knowledge about the business itself. So it's something to think about, but I suppose one thing we're now thinking about, well, what are the benefits of all this? Why should we be thinking about all this investment in our people? So one of the key benefits of investing in people is you will end up with very high performing individuals. And high performing individuals tends to lead to high performing organizations. But what you will end up with is a workforce that has a really, really strong skill set mix. They'll have a background probably in accounting and finance. They'll have an ability in, in analytics, um, knowledge of big data, how to use it and how to visualize it. And crucially, they'll know how to tell the story to the business. They'll have built really strong relationships across the business and they'll know how to negotiate and influence as well. And that is a really, really powerful combination. And because of that, you have a very, very employable and transferable skill set. Engaged and motivated people. But the main thing for me is it means that they'll be really highly sought after from within the business. And this is what gets you the seat at the table with the discussions and helps open up the discussions. The other thing, and it's probably a benefit on both sides, is that through those networks that your finance partners are going to be developing and creating, it opens up masses of opportunity for them. And I've actually had it now in my function, there's three people who are, have been able to take opportunities in the last month for new roles within the organization, whether it be commercial, uh, in our governance and assurance, or out in the operations area. Um, and you might think that that's not great, but it is really what you want because it keeps building the networks. Um, and particularly from the finance area, it builds the networks. And that is really what is the key to transforming from finance also being the, rather than being the back office function, from actually going out and co-piloting with the business. So I guess I'll just leave you with one thing. When you're embarking on your transformation journey, have a really, really clear scope and, and goal of what you're seeking to transform. Is it your processes and procedures and technology? Or is it actually the mindset of your people? Because if you just focus on the former, you could be missing out on a key, key component that will guarantee the success of your finance transformation. Thank you. Connor, thank you very much for a great presentation and thank you for highlighting all the different skill set that is now required from an XPNA business partner and ending with you know, the benefit in investing on all of these, which is fantastic. So thank you very much for that. I would like to invite um, Raul and Himashi to come and join us and give us some quick comments on the presentation. Um, if I may start with you, Raul. Yep. Uh, thanks, Hans. Uh, I think it was a great uh, presentation, Connor. What what I really like and what stood out was how you stressed upon the uh, balancing the investment. I think that was the key takeaway from your presentation. It's not just technology that will help you get better at business partnering, but it is also about the people. It is about their mindset and their skill set. And I really like the quote when you started with curiosity. Uh, I think uh, it, it has its own existence. And uh, you rightly mentioned, curious team members are key to your transformational journey and your XPNA business partnering. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. And uh, Himashi, your quick comment, please. Yeah, great, great presentation, Connor. I re really appreciate it. Um, I thought you, you offered some really practical suggestions on how finance leaders can create an environment for growth. You know, as you mentioned, good leaders ask a lot of questions. Um, to their te teams, and it's really creating that expectation that questions are encouraged. Um, you know, the learning really happens in the search for the answers and finding that expertise. So as you mentioned, this can be even more valuable if that requires reaching out to, to other experts um, from other teams. And you know, what I thought about as you were talking about that, it not only helps to develop relationships and, you know, building the confidence of the individual, but also building that trust within the relationship and eventually becoming, um, you know, that trusted business partner. So great stuff. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. 
Thank you, members, and thank you, Connor, for a, a great presentation. Let us now move on and ask our uh, attendees today, our members today, about uh, what do they think should be um, the skill set required in the organization to develop for better FPNA business partnering? So, what other skills do you think your organization need to develop for better FPNA business partnering? Uh, first one is business knowledge, second one is data skills. Uh, third one is your softer skills, and fourth one is technological uh, skills. So first option, business knowledge, second option, data skills, third one, softer skills, and the fourth one is technological skills. If you can vote, please, uh, that would be great. Uh, we've got 50% voted already. I'll give it another five seconds, um, and I'm going to close it uh, now. So we can see 42% have gone for business knowledge, 23% for data skills, 28% for soft skills, 8% for technological skills. Connor, if I may come to yourself for a quick comment on what we're seeing here, please. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a relatively even spread between data and softer. I would have thought softer would be higher, um, but maybe that's tipped into the business knowledge. So clearly people feel that the real way to um, ensure the success of, of finance partnering and probably to build that um, credibility is you've got to know your business first. Absolutely and you shared with us quite a few examples uh, around business knowledge how to go about getting that you know shadowing etc and just working with uh, the different unit to achieve that so Thank you very much for that, Connor. Um, let me now hide this and let us move on to our next section of the presentation for today, um, which is around the role of modern technology. And to deliver that, we've got Raoul from uh, Jedox. Raoul, ready when you are. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, uh, hi, hi, everyone. I'm Raoul Pandey, Principal Consultant for Solution Advisory Jedox. So just to give you a context about Jerox, uh, it's an enterprise performance management solution for planning, analysis, reporting, and optimization of value creation processes. Whether it is finance, sales, human resources, marketing, or procurement, all the business user units can collaboratively create strategic and operational plan. And also it continuously uh, helps you to measure, monitor, and improve your realization. And I would like to start off uh, with a quote from Henry Ford, which stands true for technology coming together is a beginning which is the need to identify and prioritize the need for technology in your business process staying together is progress which is uh, execution and alignment of uh, technology within your business and last uh, which is work working together is uh, success which is talking about harmony of people process and technology which will yield quick time to value and with that i would like to introduce the four main pillars which i think uh, hans covered in the earlier discussion uh, which will help you to enhance and transform the business partnering process that's the next slide um, i would like to tie each pillar with the technology aspect so first one uh, is the collaboration which um, ties nicely with extended planning and analysis uh, we've got analytical approach which ties back with uh, data quality and integration uh, and challenging the status quo which ties in with embracing ai and predictive and finally the most important piece for me uh, which is the people piece it's talking about motivating and educating which ties back with uh, start small and deliver quick time to value so what i'll do is uh, explain each of these points in bit uh, more detail and i would like to start off with collaboration which is the next slide and this is i would like to bring two facts from the ground based on surveys that were done by different people the first one is around the burden of data gathering activities 79 percent of the people who were part of the survey they said that they spend at least 30 percent of the time on activities that do not add value to the business and second uh, one is the importance of finance role in supporting a business decisions uh, it, it's, it has increased during the COVID time and it has increased tremendously but unfortunately 23 percent of the people said they were not ready for it which takes me to the next slide which where i talk about how technology can help you in that space. So the goal, the ultimate goal for us is to move towards a holistic performance management, which is what we are basically right now. The departments and silos and from different systems to an environment where everything comes together, which is your extended planning and analysis. And you have a vision for it. 
and I would like to share uh, one of the examples, uh, one of the customer stories, uh, one of uh, leading retail and distribution of lifestyle footwear. And they grew tremendously from uh, 20 stores to 420 stores, but they had a vision to reach where they wanted to. They wanted a technology that will enable them to do a single version of truth, help them provide an omni-channel view of the entire organization, as well as uh, support planning and budgeting function across the entire organization. So the first focus uh, was to create components for their budget to start uh, their fiscal year budgeting process. Once the budget model was finalized, they started working on the reforecasting model, uh, month end reporting for capability. Uh, and then also they talked about uh, financial consolidation. And finally, they had a payroll compliance model. So I think with that, um, I would like to move to the next uh, point, which is analytical approach, which ties back with quality and integration. Um, I think 80% of the CFOs agree that they must take ownership of their quality, the timeliness, and the depth of all the business information which is available. But unfortunately, one third of them said they were not in a position to do so. And let's see how we can connect the technology in this area and bring make the CFO score much better. And uh, with that, uh, I think uh, starting with the next slide, which is uh, talking about the end goal, which is to improve the quality and completeness of the data uh, in order to enable uh, effective business decisions. And this ties back to uh, I think what uh, Connor and Takeshi mentioned in their uh, in their in their presentation is freeing up time from data cleaning to move to value added activities. And there are a few things that you need to consider when you are actually talking about making our technology decisions. We need to have a technology which uh, has the ability to integrate across different sources uh, across the organization. It also needs to have an ability to use predictive AI that will help you to a valid uh, data quality if that is a possibility and last but not the least which is it, it has to be easy to use the transition from excel uh, has to be very smooth and i would like to uh, share one of the customer stories here again uh, which is from a customer who are into sustainable uh, commercial fishing uh, they started using technology to bring their financial sales and operational data from different sources they wanted to have a single version of truth and they wanted to use technology to do real time insights and get a better visibility into their performance. So with that, um, uh, I would like to move to the third point, which is challenging the status quo, which ties back to embracing AI and predictive. So a couple of points uh, from the ground. Uh, we all know uh, and we all agree that Excel still rules. 84% of the finance executive are saying they still do stuff uh, in the online spreadsheet, which absolutely makes sense. And the second one uh, is around the areas of shift between current and future priorities. There were actually five different priorities in this article from where I've taken the statistic, but I would like to focus on one of the main ones, which is rationalization, simplification and increased automation of your financial systems. We all we all see the need in the current priority. Thirty nine percent agree. Uh, and in future priority, this might actually go up to fifty one percent. And it's a quite an interesting point. So let's let's look at how solution, how technology can help and uh, we'll move on to the next slide. So, yeah, I think the goal is to leverage AI and predictive to respond rapidly and also as well as augment decision making. Again, um, stressing on the Takeshi's approach on advanced analytics so using machine learning and artificial intelligence. I certainly believe that using predictive in some things will help. It will help you increase the focus. It will help you increase the speed and accuracy. It will free up resources uh, by increasing automation. You can also bring in sufficient size and quality of data. You can identify drivers where which are both internal as well as external. And with that, I would like to also share a customer story from a hospitality sector. So they were able to improve their forecasting results um, using AI and machine learning. So they they actually moved from uh, the manual based Excel process uh, and they were able to improve the accuracy from 89 to 99%. They were able to save a lot of time on labor intensive tasks and they were able to improve quality, get a greater collaboration and engagement across the business. And with that, um, I would like to move to the last point, which I think is the most critical, in my opinion, which is uh, uh, the people piece. It's talking about motivating and educating. And I would say always start small, 
uh, and deliver quick time to value. So 67% of the people believe there is acceleration in digital transformation strategy. And since COVID, uh, it, it has actually, uh, I mean, there are, there are people talking about 63% of actually said there is an increase in the budget for such initiatives. It's very interesting topic and we would like to see what the goal is by, or in the next slide where you start thinking big uh, and you start small, but you can scale quickly. So a few points that you can consider when you want to start with your technology or the digital transformation journey is define and prioritize your need. You can start small and it is okay to fail. Uh, you can, but you'll fail quickly. And most importantly, uh, you promote user adoption. You involve the stakeholders from an early phase and that will help you get, make and make things much better. So with that, um, I would like to pass my time back to Hans. Thank you all for your time. Raul, um, thank you for sharing how technology can enhance the business partnering element and, and bring us to that next level, which is the XPNA. Um, can I ask our member of the uh, panel to come and join us, uh, Himashi and Christina, if you could join us and give us some comments on um, Raul's presentation, please. Uh, Himashi, if I may start with yourself. Sure. Um, great informative presentation, Raul. I, I like your suggestion about starting small. I think projects that are smaller in scale also make for good educational opportunities, you know, as, as this experience is, a, is the best teacher. So, you know, the process of discovery, um, the effort required to implement an education of using the new system can really move a team forward. Uh, so really like that suggestion. Thank you, Imashi. Uh, Christina, your quick comment, please. Yeah, look, I really appreciate it and, and enjoyed this presentation. Well done. I think what really helped me to to the breakdown you really illustrated what are the steps because we're all working on on this uh, digital transformation, but really breaking it apart. How to think about it? What are these the elements? And how does it relate to the technology element that we need to consider in each step? So I think that's very helpful to to clarify our thinking around how we can use these steps in, in our own journey and, and um, apply them so that, that it becomes less daunting and, and more actionable. Really good. Thank you very much, panelists, for your comments. And thank you, Raul, for a great presentation. Let us now move on and hear from our members today as to you know, how they use technology. So launching the last polling question, uh, for the day, the, and the question is: Do you currently use modern collaborative technology for FPNA? Uh, no, we do not, and do not have any plans to implement anything in the future. No, we do not at the moment, but we plan to implement something. Uh, yes, we do. If you can vote, please. Um, so the first answer is: No, we do not, and we don't have any plans. No, we do not, but have got some plans. And finally, yes, we already do. Uh, if you can vote, please, we've got 50% um, voted already. I'll give it another uh, five seconds and I am going to close the poll right now. And I'm going to share the results, which is 10% say no, they do not and have no plans at all um, for using collaborative technology. 37% say they have some plans and 54% say yes, they do. Uh, Raul, can I come to yourself for some comments on this, please? I am, I'm glad they polled uh, things that way uh, because uh, finance business pa partners are very costly and valuable resources. So having a technology is very important for you to be successful. You need to spend less time on data manipulation, reconciliation and reports, which have no direct value to the business. So I think it's good. I uh, agree with the poll where technology is very, very important. And there are people who have already started thinking about this in the near future. Thank you very much. If, if you take that 54% that are currently doing and 37% have got the plans, this is really uh, encouraging. So thank you uh, for your comment, Raul. Let me hide this and let us now move on to um, the final piece of our presentation, which is on integrative intelligence in FPNA. And to present that, we've got Himashi. Himashi, over to you. Thanks, Hans. Hello again, everyone. So today I'll be talking to you about integrative intelligence. So last year, uh, when Gartner coined uh, the term XPNA, 
they also stated that it was the natural evolution of planning and projected it would become mainstream by 2022 and integrated into a majority of new FP&A projects by 2024. So as you heard from my fellow panelists today, the aim of XPNA is really to apply FPNA tools to any department within the organization that produces business plans and layer in automated forecasting, thereby increasing the rate of forecasting. So all while deriving forecasts from teams that are close to information sources. So another term that describes this is really integrative intelligence. So what is integrative intelligence? It's work that is defined and disseminated across collaborative and fluid teams, where it is altered, improved, and acted upon to drive more action. So for XPNA to be implemented effectively, it requires key elements of an integrated intelligence framework. So I'll be reviewing today five ways you can apply the structure of integrative intelligence to your XPNA process for more holistic planning and analysis. So starting with the next slide, define shared value. So your challenge as a finance professional is to create a common focus for everyone who has a hand in the XPNA process. For example, budgeting and forecasting may not be popular processes, but they're essential. So if you're going to distribute ownership of key elements of a finance process, you must define the work process and ensure all party, parties involved understand the value it can create. So to do that, you need to recognize that diverse members of the team have different time horizons. They report to different managers and are bonused on different activities. So you must relate this back to them, create that context for them to understand what's in it for them and the broader company benefits. Next way is build with modularity. So when building out XPNA, you need to think about doing it unit by unit to build the mechanisms, steps, calculations that need to be followed. So this is actually a great opportunity to create standardization around your organization for uh, metrics, metric definitions, metric calculations, sources and uses of data, but it will require focused effort to build that alignment. In addition, modularity and design should allow you to differentiate among the sectors. So you can start and stop at different parts of a process selectively you know, perhaps running an algorithm on some GL lines every day or multiple times per day, um, or selecting revenue-based versus expense-based planning elements to run or analyze. On the next slide, we'll review how to expand your view of the team. So XPNA focuses on who's providing the information. It could be other business partners, uh, such as marketing, supply chain, call center, or research and development. It could also be other parts of finance, treasury or accounting. It could be non-employees, such as vendors, who have an a API interface into your systems, or third-party freelancers who are sitting you know, right next to you. So all of this, Sorry, all of this will happen with remote teams that are physically distributed around the world. Additionally, you'll also have to think about al algorithms and bots as members of the team and how to manage them. So on to the next slide with developing project management skills. The key of working through other people is effective project management skills. You know, it's not glamorous work, but it's part of leadership. So distributing work requires creating that cadence of operations, such as how does the group communicate? Where and how is the information stored? When is it accessed? How do you update each other? And how are decisions made? These core management skills are really gonna be vital in an XPNA world. And lastly, on the final slide, provide effective challenge. If FPNA works right, it will create efficiencies where you're spending less time gathering and preparing data. Gaining time back 
means that finance can spend more time on value added activities as Rahul was talking about. You know, what a tremendous opportunity to spend more time on analyzing projections or looking at competitive benchmarks and considering macroeconomic impacts. So really focusing on the true work of being that trusted business partner, challenging assumptions, asking the tough questions, and pushing for data-driven insights and answers. So to recap here, XPNA is more than a technology installation. It offers a refreshing way to think about what work finance is trying to accomplish and how it gets done. And this requires you to apply all your FPNA skills, finance acumen and interpersonal skills, plus team effectiveness, in addition to technology and data. So the framework of integrative intelligence is really designed for this. Thank you for your time. Hey, Marcia, thank you very much. And thank you for introducing us to integrative intelligence and the five key pillars of how you go about doing this. So great, thank you very much for that. Uh, Raul, can I ask you for some quick comment on um, Himashi's presentation, please? If you can join us, thank you. Yep, uh, I, thank you, Hans. Uh, the, Himashi, the presentation was great. I like the concept of uh, defined shared value. Uh, it's important for people to be engaged and it's important for them to see what the purpose is. And you also mentioned about you need to build unit by unit uh, by bringing uh, success, tying back to what I actually covered. Think big, start small, and deliver quick time to value. So very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Raul, and uh, thank you very much, Imashi, for an uh, excellent presentation. It is now a good time for us to move into some quick key takeaways. Uh, if you guys can join us, uh, please, and we will go around the house for a, a very, very quick conclusion point from each one of you. Um, so Christina, what is your 30 second key takeaway, please? Um, for me, it's important to keep the end game in mind. Why do we need to embark on this? We really need to um, identify cre value creation, um, ability to overcome the uncertainty we currently um, live in by, by really providing insights, facilitate um, the discussion and um, challenge the status quo and, and really aim for quick wins to get this credibility and, and be embedded in the, in the business and, and help them to, to grow. Takeshi, can I come to you for your quick uh, key takeaway, please? Yeah, so, so to wrap up my part, so some things that you just need the technology to make the transformation happen, but actually, you know, digital technology is just the tools uh, which are the enable to make it happen. So we, we believe what is critical is that the leaders who commit to transform and uh, you know organize process to run it with a success. So leader who drive the initiative and commitment lead the team not to give up, continue to you know try and error, continue to fine tune and adjust and improve uh, until the team start to create a positive impact. The robust process and the business rhythm uh, is critical to make this whole transformation happen with a success and. Uh, you know, even there is a strong leader and technology, uh, if there's no process uh, set up to run and execute, uh, it won't uh, land in success. So based on the learning uh, to wrap up, all this has to come close together to make the transformation happen. And then uh, what is most important is that we also need to transform ourselves, uh, brush up all the uh, strategic thinking, uh, change management, uh, focus on the higher ROI tasks, you know, uh, and that will enable us to, uh, you know, uh, turn the data into solid actions and, uh, you know, executions. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, my part. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Takeshi. Uh, Connor, your quick uh, uh, key takeaway, please. Yeah, well, being an accountant, I have to say it's all about balance. <laughs> um, so it's, again, it's, it's balancing the data, the cleaning of the data, the integration of your systems, ensuring that you've got the skill sets ready uh, to go out and help work with the business to integrate those systems. But I guess if I'm to give a, a quick soundbite, it was that the systems aren't going to lead the change, the technology is not going to lead the change, it's your people that are going to lead the change. So really look at how you can get hold of that, that curiosity and 
and that eagerness to question from your people. Thank you, Connor. Uh, Raul, your key takeaway, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hans. Uh, I think the most important goal uh, in the digital transformation journey is thinking about the end goal. Uh, I think all the panelists actually have covered this in some part in their presentation is uh, talking about the end goal. And then you can start uh, small. Uh, technology is a great uh, enabler to help you uh, start small. And obviously, there will be failures on your way. But uh, if you have the end goal, you know uh, you have a good technology, uh, you can certainly uh, achieve the results that you're looking for. Thank you. Finally, Himalshi. You know, FP&A already sits at the intersection of business decisions and finance. So to an extent, XP&A uses many of the same processes and tools as, as FP&A. So this is an evolution, um, more, of a, more than a revolution. So it builds on current trends, you know, frees finance from data, gathering burden, and makes the CFO and FP&A more valuable. So as we engage in the latest evolution, it's important to manage the waves of innovation by continuing to create value, um, staying curious about the business, and, and investing in your team. Thank you very much. It is now a good time to go on to the Q&A session. And um, our first question uh, for today goes to Christina. Uh, Christina, thank you for a um, great presentation. You talked about value creation. How hard is it to change the culture towards an XPNA uh, organization? And what can we do to move the culture to that sort of point? I, I try to develop, um, like I think the, the, the answer to this question is really helping our teams to understand the purpose of this value creation. Um, and, and not just um, like moving away from the race perspective, measuring what we did into how can we actually be part of the solution? And I think that's that's really the key point that that our teams um, make this mind shift that that they that they really move into this space. I think then, um, as soon as you have them uh, experience that ex successfully, I think the the shift will probably be challenging at the beginning, but it will be self. Um, reiterating pretty quickly because it's actually where they develop purpose, where they see can can see success and, and the, the sense of belonging to the business is, is really driving their, um, their ability to grow in that space. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, our second question goes to Takeshi. Uh, Takeshi, uh, by progressing to automation and automating decision making, which you guys have done greatly and very, very well, won't we be eliminating the need for our roles? interesting question yes yeah i think it's very very interesting um yes actually you know when i first joined microsoft we had finance in japan roughly 40 people now it's down to 20. we had 15 contractors now down to like five right but and uh you know another information is that for past 10 years microsoft worldwide has not increased any number of headcounts However, our revenue has doubled and tripled, right? And our stock price going even higher with a complex, you know, more and more complex, um, you know, business like, like a subscription model, pay as you go model in a cloud space. So everything gets very complex, but, you know, we were able to manage it without, without any increase in headcounts. So I think, you know, so it does take out the needs of our role, but, as I mentioned, what we need to do is transform ourselves, uh, be more like not just a, wear the finance hat, but you know wear the business hat, be able to influence the business and have a strategic thinking. How can we do better? How can we you know drive our business and proactively provide a recommendation to your you know business partners? That's where we need to shift our you know thinking. Otherwise, I think you know there's no need for finance. You know the old style finance so i think that all the technology will take over that role so we need to shift our trust and transform ourselves how we do our business with our business partners thank you uh yeah, Katie, great yeah. answer there yeah. and, and i think your your last slide really showed uh you know how the skill sets change so really it's not losing our job it's getting better at value add um finance 
uh, an XPNA or FPNA rather than um, anything else. So, so thank you very much for that. And our third question now goes to um, Connor. In interesting question, Connor. Um, of course, you shared to us a uh, uh, skill set. Is XPNA genuinely within the reach of small to medium sized organization? Do you think 50 million dollar, 100 employees turnover? Um, what, what is your thought on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it can be in small family businesses even. I think it's it's all about, I think Takeshi said it, it's, it's about understanding the business and really changing the way that you're thinking about where you add the value. Um, so when you switch from thinking that your values in in pulling together the historical financial accounts each month to actually looking about where's the business going, where are we helping to achieve value in the business and build enterprise value? An enterprise value can be a hundred thousand dollar turnover, it can be a hundred billion dollar turnover. I think the principles the same, uh, irrespective of the size of the business. So yes, I think it is attainable, and I think it should be looked towards being something that you, you focus on. Great answer there, Connor, and, and absolutely spot on. I, I, I think it's got to be in the DNA. It's got to be something that is high on your agenda and you've got to push towards it. You know, the skill set, you need it. It doesn't matter whether you're small, big or, you know, massive in that sort of perspective. Thank you for that. Um, our fourth question to uh, Raul. Raul, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, what would you say um, the steps are or you should be taking on your journey to implementing an integrated sort of platform that you talked about? You know, what are the key things we need to think of uh, when we're starting on that journey? Yeah, again, uh, I think that is exactly uh, what I mentioned about, uh, yes, technology can help you uh, get to that journey, but it's all important uh, to have a goal in mind and then uh, start small. So I'd like to uh, share one of the customer stories uh, and it's very apt. Uh, so customer wanted to implement a sales uh, forecasting system uh, supported with uh, predictive analytics, but it does not mean you need to start with AI. You need to start with predictive analytics. You need to first optimize and streamline your planning, your sales forecasting. So it's a process. And often the, the first step is to lift what you're currently doing, uh, move your Excel spreadsheets to a system that will offer uh, workflow, a role based access and integration to data sources, which is also a very important uh, factor in any transformation journey. And once the financial process is optimized, then you can start looking at further integrating your operational plan in your sales, in your HR. And then once once you do that, uh, then you can start uh, bringing in the advanced analytical capabilities and decision support, which is using your predictive NAI. Raul, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And, and you know, that, that's really helpful. Um, our final question goes to um, Himashi. Uh, Himashi, you talked about expanding your view of the team in your five pillars. Um, what do you see are the challenges there um, and, and what can we do to uh, take that into account? Um, I think probably the biggest challenge would be change management. And um, I think that is really the theme that was woven in, in in all of our presentations. And we can't really underestimate the importance of change management. It's not only um, you know the people that are doing the change, but it's also those are that are that are um, implementing it. So um, kind of you should be mindful of that. Um, and it's it's having that balance with having the right skills it's creating that environment to make mistakes and and to take risks um so kind of fostering that that um environment of of openness and kind of asking questions and being curious thank you very much Imashi. Um, we've got one general question that I would like to put to you guys, um, and of course, let's be quick about it. So, uh, um, what would be your top two step for building an XPNA business partnering? What are the key things you you will think of? How do we start? Um, can I start with yourself, Christina? A quick two step, please. Yeah, I, I think for us, it is really coming around the data, the standardization, the cleansing, really bringing this platform together. That um, what we are actually bringing together is is um, real insights, 
But in parallel, obviously, the people side, as everyone mentioned, um, we can build that in parallel. It doesn't need to be sequential. I think that's the two steps we need to work on. Uh, Takeshi, to you, please. Yeah, so the first one, uh, absolutely the data cleansing uh, and leverage technology and extract all the insight from the data. The second one is definitely the people piece, uh, you know, uh, the way we do a business, how we think about driving the business is the kind of a core uh, to make it happen. So that's that's that on my side. Thank you. Connor, to yourself. Yeah, I'm just thinking what to add there. It, it is the data in, in the information. I, I think you've got to have something to go out to the business with. So if you don't have trust and confidence in that information that you're going out with, that you not going to get over the first hurdle. So I'm um, just thinking about it on the fly there. It has to be um, a bit like a salesperson. What are you going out to sell to the business and convince them that that you've got the information that they need? Um, so I'll, I think I'll stick with the data and, and the tools that you're doing it. But then it's how you deliver the message. And that's where the relationship building and, and the finance partner skill sets, the softer skill sets um, need to be focused on too. Uh, Rahul, what would it be for you? Yeah, I think uh, it's data and technology uh, and uh, also very important piece is the skill set. Uh, I think it's also important to uh, balance the investment, I think, um, between technology and people. Thank you. And finally, Himashi. Um, I agree with all my panelists. The only thing that I would add is just that define share value. We're, you know, ensuring that all parties that are involved really understand what the value that they're co contributing to. The, to. And Thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, great session and, and great comments and great um, answers to those lovely questions. So just moving on, a couple of um, slides to just uh, remind our um, uh, attendees as to where they can join us next. So. Um, AFP Finex, which is on the 15th to the 17th of June, not much time left, so please um, join us. And it is a free event as well. And FPNA Trends will be uh, partnering with AFP around a round table there. So please join us, register now. Uh, there's also a link um, on your slide, which you will click and it'll take you straight there. What else is next? So upcoming FPNA Trends event. We've got the Digital Middle Eastern FPNA board. We're talking about FPNA scenario planning. Uh, May the 24th for the, your diary. Again, the link is in the slide. But the next one is FPNA Trends webinar, where we're talking about moving to the digital and data driven FPNA. Very important. June the 10th, please join us there as well. Uh, it is now a good time to say thank you to our sponsors, uh, Jedox, thank you very much. Michael Page, thank you very much. AFP, thank you very much. Without you guys, uh, we wouldn't have been able to bring this to our members. Uh, and a big thank you to our panelists for a great presentation, great insight, and of course, great answers to those lovely questions put together by um, our uh, attendees on the day. Um, finally, a big thank you um, to all of the attendees um, for making time and also for sharing with us all the insight into your organization with the four polling questions. Um, finally, um, these are ways for you to keep, keep and stay connected with us, so uh, please do so. Uh, just before um, I close the meeting, I would like to remind you that there's a feedback session at the end when I close. So your feedback is very, very important. Please uh, give us your feedback and potential um, subject for the future. So this is the end of our meeting for today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We hope to see you in all of those three meetings uh, I've just uh, taken you uh, through in the near future. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is the end of our mm -hmm. webinar. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.